Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, another one of our webinars in the webinar series for the Bushfire CRC. Um, these webinars are really designed to, um, with the aim of um, facilitating the research utilisation of the work of the bushfire researchers. Um, and today we've actually added a dimension of a bit of, um, I guess, international flavour with our speaker from New Zealand. Um, just a few hygiene things, I guess, before we start, um, and that is that you'll notice in the bottom left-hand corner is a, a free text box. At the end of Lisa's presentation, and she'll be speaking for 30 to 40 minutes, um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, and please use that free text box, which is in the bottom left. Um, of your screen. If at some stage during the presentation you really don't understand something or need clarity, um, I'll be monitoring that and you could key in um, a, a question for clarification, um, which we'll try and flag to Lisa. Um, the other thing to note is that the webinar will be available probably by the weekend on the Bushfire CRC and ASAC websites. Um, so it's my um, pleasure today to welcome Lisa Langer from New Zealand. She is a senior scientist with the um, Rural Fire Research Group of Saigon, the New Zealand Crown Research Institute. Lisa specialises in social um, and social uh, research facilitating community dialogue to assist in uh, policy development and has a special regard for community resilience and recovery following wildfires. She is currently leading the research focused on the enhancement of community resilience and the New Zealand component of the um, Bushfire CRC's Effective Wildfire Communication Project. Um, so that's a nice segue into her title today, Effectiveness of Wildfire Messages to New Zealand Communities. And it's my pleasure to welcome Lisa Langer. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you for your time today. Oh. Yeah, Tato, and, and thank you, Sue and Michelle and, and Amy previously. Um, and greetings from um, sunny Christchurch. Um, sun's been streaming in my window on a, a, a cool winter's day, but... Um, um, first, I'd really like to um, acknowledge my co-author, Mary Hart, who has worked through me, with me on this project. Right, technical hitch. Get started. All right, this, this is very new to me, I, I hasten to add, having um, never sp spoken to my computer rather than to, to people, so I hope it goes all right. But just to, to get started, I thought I really needed to um, just say something to set the, set the scene and the New Zealand context and kind of to remind that fire in New Zealand is different from um, Australia, that fire is not part of our natural ecosystem and we don't have large um, bushfires affecting our communities. We have quite a few small fires that are happening um, in New Zealand on an annual basis, over 3,000 um, statistics for the 16 years up to 2007, um, with a modest number of hectares burnt. But climate change predicts that um, we will have an, be uh, increasing the number and extent of fires. And really what's important to the discussion today is that most of our wildfires result from human causes. And in fact, we only have in the order of 1% of lightning fires in New Zealand. So what causes these fires? Well, um, our statistics suggest that um, the largest proportion of those of a known cause are from land clearing burns, so some form of um, land uh, management activities, but there are also increasing number of um, fires that are deliberately lit. Um, on top of that, we do have, like the rest of the world, an increasing area in the rural urban interface or bushfire urban interfaces called in, in um, Australia. Um, so what's different about our communities? So we've got communities that are, have um, experienced very few fires, um, certainly not large fires. Um, they're actually probably more aware of earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and even, even snowstorms. So asking them about preparedness, they're more likely to have prepared for one of these 
um, natural events rather than a wildfire. Um, so individuals really appear to lack a, an a adequate awareness of wildfire risk and they underestimate this risk. Um, hence they're underprepared and I maintain that they're therefore very vulnerable to wildfires. So I think that's um, one of the motivations for this work is that our um, communities are vulnerable as they are not um, particularly aware of wildfire risk and the risk for the future and um, they certainly are not thinking of the future in terms of increased risk. So people are actually the potential source of um, um, ignition, not just the possible victims of a wildfire. And this is one of the focuses of my studies to look at um, human causes and the people actually being um, the cause of these ignitions. Um, so why are we doing this research? I mean, in New Zealand we have um, a varied level of communication um, from minimal community engagement and education through a variety of rather one-way broadcast um, approaches, which I'll discuss um, later in my talk, but also um, are starting to see more need for communication and involving our communities and starting to um, establish fire smart activities which are similar to those in the US um, known as fire wise. Um, so our end users are really calling for more information on the most effective communication techniques um, to form and educate our communities. Um, and I believe that effective communication is really the key to minimising the number of human co caused fires in New Zealand and hence the impact that these wildfires have on our community. Well, we certainly look to the rest of the world for um, research findings and um, really need to adapt those to the New Zealand situation but I'm certainly grateful for um, support both from my New Zealand government but also from the Bushfire CIC and um, USDA to enable me to um, attend conferences in the US and in Australia um, and to look at the research um, as well as obviously my, my own reading. So very much the background to our research. So to focus this I want to do today on um, the study. This is um, a study that I've undertaken along with Mary Hart, my collaborator, um, to determine the most effective communication strategies to inform and educate communities about wildfire risk and preparedness in New Zealand. Um, it's part of the Bushfire CRC um, wider project and we're working in collaboration with MRIT um, in Melbourne, partly funded by the Bushfire CRC, which we're obviously very grateful for the New Zealand government and we do have support from our New Zealand end users. Um, the, the kind of part of the research that is particularly um, relevant I, I think is to focus on the fact that this research has been conducted in a less fire prone environment. So though it is different it's also capturing another sector of, of the world in terms of environments that are less wild. Um, wildfire prone. Um, I just thought I'd also mention that I was lucky to have a collaborator who came to New Zealand and I was um, even more fortunate to go back to Lisbon and work with her and um, a co collaborator Maria Colasso has actually repeated the same research design in Portugal and we certainly hope to make comparisons with that. Um, her findings in the, in the future. So she likewise has had the same approach as we've done here with case studies. Um, so our methodology has been adapted from the RMIT methodology for the New Zealand context and we have um, chosen three New Zealand case studies and we chose these in discussion with our end users um, to ensure that we covered both the requirements of the wider study to fit it in with RMIT's objectives but also to find appropriate communities in New Zealand. Um, we be began each of our case studies with a uh, focus group with what we've um, called our key respondents 
Um, so we really started by understanding what um, the relevant agencies had been conducting in terms of past and current communication efforts in the area prior to interviewing on a face-to-face -face basis with um, semi-structured interviews, a range of community um, participants. We also ran a focus group in each case study and um, just to mention too that we were covered by ethics approval from the Waikato University and all our um, data, and there's been quite a lot of it I might add, um, has been analysed through coding and analysis using the NVivo software. Um, so kind of in a nutshell, looking at the, um, the number of participants we've had, We've had um, interviews or um, focus groups with 80, with 80 people, uh, 50 of those being community participants and eight from um, a national selection of those from our National Rural Fire Authority, the De Department of Conservation and a forest and a land manager, two, two, two there. Um, we also interviewed or had focus groups with um, 22 key respondents within the um, case study areas and these were from the Rural Fire Authority or RFA as we use the acronym, um, the Department of Conservation, local district councils and also our volunteer fire forces. Um, in terms of the community, um, we captured these um, by really word of mouth during our own exploration in terms of getting a range of um, people within the community um, and really using a snowballing approach to, um, to this, starting with our known contacts with our um, key respondents. But we also did um, try and advertise this and, and in the case of one of our case studies we used an email that was sent around through um, some of the fire wardens, which I'll talk about in, in a moment in terms of through the community and their networks. And we put up advertisements on local notice boards and, and into school newsletters and a number of different mechanisms. So we did try and um, capture a range of community voices. Um, all the community um, interviews were conducted face to face. The national ones predominantly face to face. Um, just a couple that were done by phone. Um, so just to give you a bit of a, a picture of, of our case study participants, we've had um, virtually equal similar numbers of, of men and women, um, slightly more men. Um, the ages were distributed um, across the um, age classes between 18 and over 65 with more in the middle age class of 45 to 64 and this really um, certainly um, reflected the case studies themselves as, our, as two of our um, case studies were situated on recently steep sites and had a smaller older population. So we had three case studies, these were spread throughout New Zealand. Um, the first one I'll refer to is um, on Mahia Peninsula up in the Hawke's um, Bay, it's that little jut of land that um, protrudes out south of Gisborne. Um, the next one was Utterfy, just north um, of Nelson, really on the urban fringe of the city of Nelson. And the third one was in Closeburn. Um, close to Queenstown in our region of Otago, so three um, throughout New Zealand. Um, I'll just give you a very brief rundown of each of the case studies. Um, the first one here, Mahia, so this is on the east coast of the North Island. It, was a it well, is a traditional rural uh, farming community. Um, it's on a isthmus, <laughs> um, juts out into the ocean, um, and it has both rural properties but also beach homes um, or batches as they're often known in New Zealand with many visitors over the summer months both in these batches and campgrounds. Um, a small active volunteer fire force. Um, they experienced, and we're talking in an order of a thousand residents, um, they experienced a wildfire in February 2009 with an order of 
175 people were evacuated and eight buildings were destroyed along with 140 um, hectares of forest and scrub. So there was certainly um, quite a devastating community impact. Um, though fortunately no fatalities is, is not usually the case in New Zealand. Um, but it's it certainly an area that does um, receive a high fire risk and you can see there a quote, it's probably one of the only places in New Zealand that would rival Canterbury, which is where I live, on very high fire work, uh, risk for fire danger in depth when it's hitting its peak, I would think. So that was a view on one of our local um, key respondents. Moving now to our second case study in Atasai, close to Nelson. This was um, to capture the rural urban interface. So it was really as much as anything an urban fringe community close to the community of um, Nelson. It was um, disjointed from Nelson, but most people were deriving their services from Nelson. So there was a fair degree of um, connection and traffic in and out of Nelson on a daily basis. Um, this population in the order of 2,000 people, or people um, and they'd had a large fire in terms of New Zealand, large, um, and also in February 2009 when over 200 um, properties were evacuated. They'd also had previous fires in um, 1997 and 2002. So um, minimal fire ignitions, um, certainly a level of um, suburban properties, but some um, permitted fires in the rural properties and surrounding. Um, as you see there, a kind of picture of the um, case study area. Atafai has got quite a few disjointed community. We're only joined by the main road, so to get one up to one community, you've got to come back down main road, you get up to the next community, back down to the main road and up to the next community. So it's not a community with a central heart, but it does have a level of um, services um, and um, early childhood education centres, so it's got a primary school, um, a plunket, an early learning centre, a local store um, and um, I think a video area um, for purchase hire. Um, so a number of focal points. Um, in contrast to um, Mahia, which I just mentioned, that had um, campground, local store, um, but um, the school was just off the peninsula. And um, the Mahia Peninsula of, of note, I should also head a number of Marae for the Maori population, which is quite high in the area. So moving on to the third coast, um, case study, which is Close Burn. Um, this is near a tourist town of Queenstown. Um, there were large blocks um, and a diverse cluster of community, um, some very high um, value properties, um, but also rental um, owners and not all high socioeconomic. There's certainly um, a number of people who were absentee landlords or owners, so only using their properties for a few months each year. Um, no community services at all, all services were derived um, from Queenstown, so no local store, no um, golf course, nothing in terms of the way of a focus point. Um, however, the um, communities, um, a number of them are arranged in terms of corporate bodies and um, they experienced a um, large fire and. Um, 2005, when over 100 properties, the, sorry, properties were evacuated, and they've had smaller properties in 2010, 2012, and in fact, immediately following our interviews in 2012. And the response to the um, fire in 2005, they did prepare a red zone response plan, which has been implemented and has high focus for both the agencies and the communities. And during this they set up a series of community fire wardens. So pe members of the community that were acting as conduit for information and planning for future fires, but also um, prevention and preparedness. As you can see in the photo, some of it's quite on steep terrain. 
um, wilding conifers and high winds, but also fabulous views looking out over Lake Wakatipu. Um, the, as you'll see in that comment, the um, pines have not been there from um, the start. They've developed and um, there's quite considerable efforts going on to clear them because they represent a very high fuel loading. So what is effective um, wildfire communication? Well, we've defined it as a process that ensures correct messages are delivered in the most appropriate way to individuals and communities to allow them to understand and thereby act upon risks of wildfire, prevent wildfires from occurring and be prepared for wildfires. So there are a number of different components for that. Um, we see the principal purposes, therefore, is to increase the wildfire, the awareness of wildfire risk, provide information on the risk permits and restrictions that are required to, to burn in New Zealand, improve fire prevention measures and mitigation measures, and to improve levels of preparedness for wildfires. So that's the that's the um, background um, way we um, we have defined communication and it's effective and also the elements thereof. So turning again to our three communities um, in our case study areas and what we've learnt from them was first we kind of when we looked at our communities that we realised we weren't dealing with um, everybody in a, in a light manner. So within our case studies we had rural and semi-rural properties but we also had um, quite a number of properties that were really suburban and Suburban properties are not dissimilar to those within an urban city, but also they generally have no need to light a fire for land management, so a different type of um, target audience. And um, in Close Burn, we um, really didn't have suburban areas, but in our other two case studies, at Atafaya and Mahia, we did. So let's look at... Um, um, fire users and non-fire users, and this is the way we've decided to structure our data. And you know, we we really um, grappled for some quite some time of how we were going to approach it and really um, fine tune or hone down on on our rather large data set. Um, and really, we started seeing more clarity when we broke it in terms of fire users and non-users. So we first look at um, fire users. I'm going to need a sip of water to keep me going, sorry. So most New Zealanders do not use fire. They don't pose any risk to starting a rural fire unless they become a recreational fire user. Um, they generally lack awareness of fire risk. They're vulnerable to wildfires that could occur. And we believe the, community, the communication needs to focus on increasing levels of awareness and increasing preparedness should a wildfire prepare. So those are the two focus elements that are required for non-fire users. If we move on to fire users, the largest group of these are what we've called rural and semi-rural fire users. So this includes farmers, but also lifestylers, which tends to be a, a New Zealand term for those living on a small property and generally deriving some kind of um, small scale farming operation from their land. But also those on the margin of the ur urban areas adjoining rural land. So we've kind of broadened that to set, call those rural and semi-rural fire users. Um, these people generally like fires for land management, you know, clearing vegetation, rubbish burns, you know, kind of, um, some, in, in the order of um, those kind of operations. And on the whole, we found those we interviewed, the rural users had generally quite a, a reasonable level of awareness and knowledge around fire practice. Um, we were conscious of the fact that um, though we interviewed people on quite a lot of rural properties, there weren't many that really fell into the lifestyle um, category of burning rubbish and maintaining a, a property with um, um, some kind of form of economic gain from the property. 
but um, certainly those with more rural um, sector of this um, category were on the whole generally reasonably well um, voiced with um, information. But they do want information around fire restrictions, around the permits, they need to know exactly what they can do and what they can't do and when. Um, they also need to be kept aware of the fire risk. Um, they need information on fire prevention because they are the people who are lighting fires and as I said at the beginning they are also um, people who have caused the largest number and the biggest area burnt of known wildfires um, and they obviously do need to be prepared for wildfires themselves. We've got another category of um, fire users and these are what we've called recreational users. These people like bonfires and campfires, they use fireworks. Um, they're generally visitors to rural areas, they're urban dwellers, um, some of them live overseas, some of them are pro ab absentee property owners. And um, repeatedly through our interviews and focus groups, um, it came through that other people were seeing them that they pose a considerable risk as they often lacked or awareness and knowledge and at times ignored restrictions. Um, they felt they were often overlooked and these um, people, this um, recreational user or visitor group require ta um, tailored communication to increase their awareness of the risk, um, provide information on restrictions and fire prevention. Um, I've got a third category and this is for our um, cultural users. Um, in New Zealand we have our Māori um, community and um, particularly in our Mahia case study there was a high pro proportion of Māori but uh, Māori live throughout New Zealand. Um, Māori generally um, are cooking food for large events such as tangi or funerals and celebrations at their marae, so a marae is their meeting house. And they do this in a very organised manner. Um, a hangi or umu is um, generally an earthen oven, so um, um, below the ground. And on the whole, we were generally aware of them complying with the restrictions and having permits. Um, we are not aware of many fires that have occurred through um, practices around hangi. But these people, these cultural users, do need to be kept aware of the risk of fire, they need information on permits and fire prevention and preparedness. So this is kind of a summary table really now showing the what I've already discussed in terms of users and the non-users and they're sort also identifying the three squares where it's got um, N slash A is not applicable, we don't see that um, non-users need information on the restrictions or fire prevention um, to the same degree as the others, also recreational users, their focus is more on the awareness, the information and the prevention. And this is I think important because resources are limited and we need to tailor the communication to meet the specific needs of the audience. So that's now the, the basis from which I now um, proceed in terms of discussing the uh, means of communication. Um, so, you know, how do we communicate? Well, we all know there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, we have our traditional one-way broadcast communication methods that are used throughout the world, um, anything from a leaflet, um, signs, local media which could be radio, television or newspaper or even um, council newsletters, um, website information, increasingly um, some use of social media and I think there is still definitely a case for one way broadcast communication. Um, I think it's how it's used that's important. The leaflets need to be kept simple and often targeted um, in, or linked to some means of two-way communication where there's a face-to-face -face, um, contact and some opportunity for dialogue. Um, signs are, are good, um, we know that the people are aware of them but they need to be updated regularly and they also need to ensure they target other groups such as 
um, our visitors, our um, recreational users. So maybe they need to be associated where our visitors are picnicking, a start of tracks, um, and similar uh, ventures. Um, our local um, media um, certainly is, is another broadcast and quite effective way of getting messages across. But I think it too can be targeted, whether it's for our rural and semi-rural um, farmers and other land users who listen to farming programs on the, um, the radio, or um, really trying to ensure that a particular audience is being um, contacted or uh, reached. Um, websites are, um, are very much as a source of information for um, our rural and semi-rural um, fire users, particularly our rural fire authority and council websites where they're looking for information. But it's also an opportunity to provide information on property um, prevention in terms of um, defensible space and information in, in that respect. Um, in terms of websites for our visitors, I think it's important that we also have information where our visitors, particularly our overseas visitors, are going to access information. Um, if they're going to the Department of Conservation websites um, and other um, access points for information, that's a, obviously a target area to provide information. Um, social media is um, something we actually found that our um, participants had not made a great deal of use of, but were open to that idea. So there were not a lot of users, both of Facebook and Twitter, um, and they felt that if it was um, during a, or immediately following a wildfire that it could be a um, useful communication mechanism, um, but likewise if there was extreme fire danger as a source of information. So though the focus is probably on increasing awareness, it does, those mechanisms can also be used in targeted means um, such as providing information for fire users. Um, we've got another one um, is communication directed through conduits. We see that the, there are some key people in our communities that we can um, use to channel our information or our communication. And I just listed a few here, um, one being emails and texts um, to people who are already engaged. And obviously, the information is available in terms of address or numbers, um, but so text and emails to permit holders, um, community fire wardens, as in a case of our red zone community, um, community leaders, Maori leaders, and where we are developing our fire start communities, where we have um, community champions leading those um, activities. Um, in terms of other conduits, um, we see that it's would be very useful to increase communication with um, people such as tourism operators, um, again, to capture the uh, visitor um, uh, recreational users, but also with fire smart um, champions and fire warders, so using those as a means to access the community. Um, our volunteer fire brigade or uh, fire force are members of our community, and each one of them has a network that we can use in terms of channeling information. Um, the one that um, obviously uh, we'd like to see more of is um, two-way dialogue. Um, we see it in two manners. One is dialogue with individuals, and the other is dialogue um, with groups. So the first one with individuals, this can be in the form of personal visits prior to permitted fires as often as um, performed in New Zealand, face-to-face um, -face talks with um, campground owners, tramping hut wardens, etc., to try and capture the uh, recreational user for the cultural fire user, site visits to Marae, particularly prior to Hangi. Um, Home visits and inspections, um, such as with fire, smart activities and fire wild prone areas, um, can be very effective in terms of discussing. And, and as one of our national key respondents said, one of the women said to me, you know what, I've looked at this whole community just differently now I've spoken to you. I can see all these hazards. Just a little bit of knowledge sparked her up enough to start questioning and looking at things differently. 
So you can see that um, conversations really can ch make changes. Um, probably a, a, from an easier point of view is two-way dialogue with groups, um, but targeting the audience, so for the rural and semi-rural um, fire users, looking at fire, farmer group meetings, rural community meetings, um, uh, recreational users looking at campgrounds, tramping huts, but also visiting clubs, maybe a, a, a mountain bike club to try and capture some of those people who are using the rural area. Um, we see that um, the, the whole two-way dialogue is a stepping stone into greater community participation and um, though that's another whole topic, I see that that's really what we need to be striving for. Um, we're initiating our red, um, our, sorry, our fire smart. We have a red zone, um, so we're starting to involve communities as being part of the solution, and really communities talking to one another and planning themselves along with our agencies um, is important. And in New Zealand, we're also looking at um, Maori use of fire and um, their input into to planning for the future. Um, I just thought I would um, say a little bit about Fire Smart. Um, it is modelled on the US uh, Firewise. We've had Michelle Steinberg to New Zealand. Um, we've also had some of our um, end users um, been in um, South Africa and looking very closely at what was done and very impressed by um, the initiatives that have been taken up in South Africa. They're relatively new to New Zealand, um, as I said, the red zone plan, we see that as really a forerunner to Fire Smart or very similar. But it really um, is communities understanding the community and piggybacking on their activities and networks and working with communities. And throughout New Zealand, um, there's considerable interest in extending this um, into other fire prone communities. So we've had a workshop um, relatively recently to explore. Um, and I'm quite impressed by the initiatives that some of our end users are taking. <coughs> so the overall emphasis of FireSmart is um, the need to work with communities. And as one of our um, interviewees and respondents said, I think working with communities and individuals and organisations on that relationship basis is essential. Leadership was mentioned as being key is key to the successful implementation and having a champion, a local champion, is someone who can drive the success within the community. <clears throat> and as this person said, a local identity or a local person to guide us, you've got to get a leader, you've got to get somebody who knows the issues and is passionate and has got the time to do it. That's the key and that's the, the key thing is to identify those people. people to get them on board and to support them to deliver what they want to do. <clears throat> um, just to say that um, the two-way dialogue I see as being um, a very important step to, um, to take. Um, I am mindful of the fact that um, it is more resource hungry, it's time consuming, um, therefore, I believe it needs to be targeted and used very um, used well in, in association with other one-way um, broadcast um, methods. So, I just really like to wrap up and um, leave some messages. Um, so, I believe that it, it is essential to target the audience. Um, we all know each community is different. I don't think I need, really need to say, say that, but it is essential to understand the community and its diversity. We need to this, um, target our specific audiences, and though we've broken it up into rural, semi-rural visitors and cultural, there are obviously other sectors within each community, whether they're absentee landlords, migrant communities, um, other sectors within each of the, those categories. But we do need to ensure that individuals and hence communities are more aware of fire risk in New Zealand and obviously the likelihood of the risk to increase in the future. 
We believe you need to tailor the message. It is important to pay attention to the best type of communication messages. So we need to think, you know, are we trying to increase um, or raise awareness of the fire risk? Are we trying to convey information on restrictions such as permits, fire seasons? Are we trying to give um, information on how to prevent a, um, a fire occurring, so how to handle fires, um, whether they're a land clearing burn or whether they're actually a um, recreational or um, cultural fire, a, a um, hangi or umu, or whether um, we're trying to provide information on preparedness to be the innocent party of, of somebody else's uh, fire, a wildfire. So we need to think about what message we're trying to convey. And I don't think we want to necessarily convey each, each of those four um, elements on each occasion. We need to think what is important at the time. We need to match those messages to the fire user or non-fire user. We need to build on existing community networks. And um, this is something we'll be furthering in the data we've collected is the importance of community networks or communication hubs, whether they're um, preschools, the morai, the volunteer fire force, the part that um, can be played by the networks that already exist and building on those networks. Um, then it's really a matter of tuning the method. Can, um, need to consider the, the method of communication. Um, there is we believe a place for the traditional broadcast one-way communication, the, 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 the cheaper option, but also can be quite effective. But think about the audience, try and target the specific audience, and where possible, combine that with a two-way dialogue, whether it's giving a um, talk to a group of farmers and leaving some brochures, whether it's going to um, a um, plunket group or an early learning centre and giving them information. Um, it needs to be um, handled in both um, two-way and one-way forms of communication. But use those um, conduits or um, fire wardens, um, community leaders, our fire smart champions is, um, are being established around the country. Use those and our volunteer fire force as a means for getting communication to the right place. Um, resource dialogue, um, sorry, two-way dialogue, as I said before, is more effective, we believe, but um, and studies suggest, but re it is resource hungry, so it needs to be used widely, wisely. So we need effective and targeted communication to work with communities to prevent fires and increase preparedness for wildfires. So I think I'd better just wrap up by acknowledging um, Bushfire CRC. Thank you for your um, contribution financially. Um, the um, New Zealand government, which is the Ministry of Business Innovation and um, Employment, MB, RMIT for um, um, allowing us to collaborate with their methodology and we look forward to trying to link our findings with their findings um, as these become available. Um, obviously our participants, our 80 participants, that um, it would not have been possible to, to make this happen, um, particularly our community participants. But also we have our Cyan Rural Fire Advisory Committee um, who are my first stepping stone in terms of um, um, asking for review and asking for guidance, and I thank them for that. So I just leave it with um, questions, and if you do want any further information, um, we do publish, um, we do put up on our website the details of there, all our publicly um, available information in terms of our fire tech transfer notes, reports, and updates, so anything that is publicly available will be placed on that forum and obviously past research is available um, there from the social research and from my colleagues from the, the wider fire group. So, thank you. Okay, thank you so much Lisa. Um, that was pretty interesting and I know that um, a lot, looking at a lot of the names on um, the, the register list today, there's a lot of people that I recognise that are, are heavily involved 
involved in this space and have done a lot of work in trying to look at exactly the things that you've been focusing on, what messages to what audiences and how. Um, if I could remind people that if they want to ask a question, there's a box at the bottom left of your screen um, and please just type the question in there. Um, and um, I, I guess my question is, there's two parts I guess to my question. One is that how difficult was it to even commence the conversation around fire when it's not one of the top or key um, hazards that um, generally communities in New Zealand face. And so that's the first question. How do you get that, I guess, increased in awareness and on people's radar? And the second question, Lisa, is did you use in some of the communities, um, I guess, community messaging that was going out regarding other hazards and piggyback on the back of that? Yes. Oh, well, thanks. So certainly good questions. Um, in accordance with the methodology, we did go to communities that had had a um, a fire, but um, we did our interviewing in 2012, and some of the fires had occurred either in 2009 or um, as in the case, case of Close Burn 2000, a fire with a, a smaller fire in 2010. Um, so they had experienced some fire, but um, certainly, um, fire is a natural hazard. Um, we're going to be working more closely in New Zealand with um, what's the, called the Natural Hazards Platform. And um, I've been interested for some time of working across hazards. So we did in our questioning ask people about what they saw as being a risk um, in terms of hazards in their area. And um, quite often, um, Earthquakes would be the first one, which was hardly surprising um, given the experiences of Christchurch. Um, so this was having an impact around New Zealand, um, particularly I'd say in the Utterfai or Nelson area. Um, but certainly asking people therefore what they thought about um, wildfire and where that was placed against the other natural hazards. Um, so we had that. Um, in terms of your second part of the question, if I remember it rightly, in terms of kind of where to with communication across hazards. Um, I think that um, this is a very important step and it, it has begun to, to some degree. I mean we do have our um, um, civil defence and emergency management and this is a MCDEM which is the Ministry of, um, someone needs to help me, um, civil defence and emergency <laughs> management I think is right. Um, and so we do look across hazards. Um, in fact, um, some of our um, fire managers will have a number, two hats. One will be a fire hat and one will have um, civil um, defence and emergency management. Um, so they two, well the elements of cross hazards do go together. Um, they're starting to look more also about response plans and um, I think and to increasing the level um, of degree it is going across hazards. So I think it's, it, ha it has begun but I think it's um, important to um, really extend that further. Okay. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions that have come up quite as yet, um, Lisa, so I will ask another one and that's to do with your red zone or fire smart. I know in Victoria um, for some time there's been, well there, there was a, a, quite an extensive program of, of um, regions or communities that were seen to have high fire risk and um, they, they established community based groups called fire guard groups and they became those champions within their communities around raising an awareness and also around sort of the, the key messages around preparation um, and prevention but I guess preparation. So um, I'm just wondering is that where you're heading with this red zone and fire smart identifying those key communities that have high fire risk? Yes. Well actually interestingly uh, um, funded by the New Zealand Fire Service Commission um, we have a study which we're wrapping up on terms of wildfire prone areas and um, 
I was asked to be part of that team and look at the social elements that we could derive. It's been a GIS basis, um, but trying to look at where our wildfire prone communities are in New Zealand. I mean, obviously our fire managers have a high degree of knowledge of their own communities, but also um, from what the um, the stats are telling us um, from the climatic point of view but also from a social point of view. And yes, I believe that that is the, um, the future and um, it was wonderful to see in our um, FireSmart workshop recently the degree of enthusiasm and the appointment of you know, um, some people who have actually got a mandate within their community to um, proceed with community activities. And that's relatively new. Um, to New Zealand. I mean the red zone in, in close to Queenstown area was one of the forerunners but since then there's um, some excellent work I believe going on in, in Southland. Um, I've just re been recently up to Northland and they've got quite a different approach up there um, but they're certainly um, approaching it and seeing that need to work alongside the community and um, see the community as, as part of the, the solution to the future. Okay, well we have a question too from um, Sally who asks Lisa, where do you see the FireSmart program and other communication initiatives sitting amongst an overall fire reduction strategy? Um, so it sort of builds on what you've just been saying really I, I guess. Yes Sally, hi. Um, Yes, I see that um, certainly one needs to have a strategy um, and in fact interestingly and Sally was part of this too as, um, as part of our Fire Smart um, workshop um, we saw the need to really um, have a well structured and thought out um, strategy in terms of fire reduction and um, prevention and I see that it's really essential that we work within the bigger picture. I think that the communication um, is not just out there as a small sector as you know give it to, to somebody um, and they'll they'll go and communicate um, on a um, piece by piece basis. I think it needs to be integral to um, national strategies. It needs support and guidance from people who have the skills and have the um, experience to, to support our um, regional staff to enable this to happen. So I think strategy is very much part of the, the overall um, requirement. That leads to a, a question that um, Karen has actually asked um, and it, it's one of the things that triggered my um, thought as well as you were talking. Karen has asked any sense or indication at this stage of people likely to stay and defend or leave and I noticed that you did refer a number of times to the number of people who've been evacuated from yes. these communities in the case of fire. Yes, interesting question Tan. Um, our farmers are probably like farmers worldwide and so I'm thinking of people with rural properties particularly where they have livestock, so animals on their properties. Um, they consider that um, what well, their first priority is their responsibility to their stock. Um, but when I studied um, a community in mid Canterbury in Mount Summers, um, there was even one farmer I interviewed who was threatened with um, arrest um, because he refused to um, to actually be evacuated. Um, I've got um, a number of um, interviews where people said that they drove through roadblocks, um, they didn't evacuate. Um, New Zealanders I think are like um, other parts of the world that you know, they want to certainly protect their animals and to um, stay on defend. Um, I think that um, oh, what's lacking, I've got a blank screen, I'll keep talking. Um, the, the thing that we really need to be mindful of and obviously in New Zealand that has been part of very much the um, preparation in Australia is being prepared and um, I think that that's probably the element that we really need to focus on if we're going to um, have our individuals um, from our household staying and defend they do need to be prepared and um, I think this is a whole part of the process of identifying wildfire prone areas 
um, but while uh, sorry, fire smart communities being developed and also looking at the defensible space, so having a clear space around properties. But what I'd add to that is um, targeting the audience. Um, we don't want an necessary roll out every property needs a defensible space because I don't believe that's appropriate to all communities in New Zealand, where it, but it is certainly appropriate to some. So I hope that's answered the question. <laughs> Um, I have, because um, we've got a few minutes left, but, but only a few minutes. Um, I know that um, the CFA, and I see that Gwen Brennan's um, been listening in too, and she was at the, um, I guess, leading of the charge um, on looking at communities, um, I guess, cohesing, the, the cohesiveness of a community, or what we call in the social capital, within a community to be able to help facilitate um, and um, I guess even lead some of that two-way um, kind of discussion. And I'm wondering if you did any um, benchmarking across the communities that you looked at in your case studies on how effective the community messaging was dependent on what what sort of rating or, or high or how, how strong the community cohesiveness, the, co the sort of social capital was of that community. Yes, uh, interesting question. Um, we have actually we're sitting on a mass of data. Um, we certainly extended beyond the um, questions that um, came from RMIT in terms of what we termed community resilience, but we were looking very much at um, networking and and exactly you know kind of the strengths of those communities, and I think that that will come out um, in the future as we have a, a chance to analyse um, that data. Um, I'd also say that um, I managed to argue and um, got acceptance from our ethics committee that we were allowed to retain our data um, beyond I think it was five years, um, and so I have open. Um, I have it accepted provided it is stored, stored safely that I can retain the information. And one of the reasons for doing that is I see that the study um, has been an opportunity to benchmark and I would like to go back to those communities following um, particularly fire smart type activities to see how things have changed. But you know, certainly the community I believe in partnership with our agencies hold the the core to to the future success of um, of the whole um, communication and readiness of our communities. Okay. Actually, so I noticed there is one question I haven't addressed from Andrew. Yes, um, yes. I understand Andrew's too. Would you have any advice for applying this research in an urban metro context? And that's, I guess, when you talked about your quite kind of mixed messages and that, you know, the tailoring of the audience, some need that real awareness, but some need who are actually the fire users needed the more, um, you know, what what are the regulations, permits, um, and, um, you know, what do I need to do to prepare? Yes, um, I think that, yeah, you're right, Sue, thank you for helping me with the answer. I think that um, certainly, um, knowing your community and, and breaking it down. I mean, I think that we were rather daunted when we first um, looked at our data, how were we going to really address this? But it was really when we started seeing not it as just a whole diverse community, but starting to look at the sectors within the community. And I think that must be true for an urban setting. If, um, we're not a homogenous community. Um, we've got communities within communities. We've got diversity. So breaking it down in terms of kind of audiences and looking at the needs of those audiences, and obviously you can't approach them all at the same time. But looking at perhaps you know where is an area we could put some um, effort and you know get some um, good um, response. Um, you know whether it's a, a migrant group, um, whether it's um, a group where um, they are actually appro um, actually deliberately lighting fires, and there's um, a real effort that needs to be um, addressed in that um, sector of a community. So I think it's a similar approach, but obviously a bit different in a large urban area. 
Okay, well, we're just coming up to the one o'clock mark, and I know some people are probably getting hungry, <laughs> potentially at our time zone. Um, again, thank you, Lisa, for that. I think it's a, a watch this space. Um, Andrew's um, voted thanks, Lisa and uh, Sue, so he's obviously got something out today, and um, I really appreciate everyone for um, being part of this. Um, it was a, a new initiative for the Bushfire CRC, and I think we've done about eight or nine now, so um, we're really starting to get some um, stickiness. So there's lots of thanks if you have a look at that text box, um, Lisa, coming through for your time. Um, and just to remind everyone, and just to remind everyone that. Um, this will be um, your webinar for those who've missed it or they might want to let their colleagues know that it's um, going to be available on the Bushfire CRC and ASAC websites probably by the weekend. All right, and, and thanks to Sue, Amy and Michelle and I think we had Laura in there too, so <laughs> thank you for that too. That would be. Okay, thank you. Well, pretty well done for your first one, Lisa. Now you can you know, use this. <laughs> I didn't and... say I was going to sign up for any more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Terrific. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye right. for your Thank afternoon. You. Bye -bye.